Um, right, carburetor install then. Um, we're actually going to split this into two parts. Um, I guess we'll label it two and three. 2B or not 2B? But... We'll go with that. <laughs> Why not? Um, so um, 2A will cover the actual installation and 2B will uh, be the section on setup and tuning. Um, so you'll hear me in a minute make a mistake saying that this was originally EFI and we were converting to carb. It of course wasn't, it was twin carburetor. Um, but obviously the installation for the Defender is, is still the same. Um, we've got a little extra section for the engine test bed showing the fuel pressure regulator from going EFI to carburetor. So let's get into it. Right, so part two of our Edelbrock installation video. Um, we're going to install the kit that we saw um, on part one on this Cobra um, that we have in here for carb swap. Originally this was on a Holly 390 and an Offy 360. We've also got a Defender 90 coming in that's fuel injected um, next week, which is having carb install and auto kick down. So we'll cover the four wheel drive aspects and converting from EFI and the auto kick down um, using that vehicle. And those two vehicles will be amalgamated together in this one video. We've made Steve happy, haven't we, Steve? So, yeah, so you say. Because <laughs> we've removed the, uh, the bonnet so you can actually film what we're up to. So um, let's have a look in the engine bay first and uh, then crack on. Right, so the first part of your carburetor install is obviously remove the intake manifold and, or, and the carburetor or injection system from your original engine. Um, then cleanliness is the key factor. You'll note on this engine, we've actually changed the cylinder heads. We put some later date 10 bolt um, heads on there, which obviously had this little notch for the injector on. Uh, that was just something else this vehicle um, w w was in for. So um, if you had original heads on there, cleaning up the mating surfaces around the waterways and around the intake ports is key. The rear, uh, the rear water ports will have um, gunk on them, for want of a better term. Schmutz. Schmutz. Deposits. Uh, deposits in them uh, because they do not flow into the intake manifold. Um, there's a reason why they don't, which we would cover. Uh, I'd like to do a video on the cooling system of Rover V8, etc. at some point, and we would cover that in that. However, obviously cleaning them out is a good idea. Um, always a good idea that to do an oil and filter change while you're doing this kind of work because you are going to end up, no matter how well you prepare this area uh, with a cover for your cleanup, you are going to end up with a, a small amount of debris in here and flushing that through brake clutch cleaner into the sump and out uh, is the best idea, ideally with the sump off, but that's not always possible. We have had the sump off this engine to check the crank bearings, however. Um, so once all surfaces are clean, um, this area as well, a little bit of brake clutch cleaner on to degrease them. We have removed the distributor in this engine, again, for ease of access. When we're doing that, we're making sure we're on TDC um, firing stroke, which means the rotor arm is pointing at roughly number one on the distributor cap, number one plug lead on the distributor cap. That just means when installing it back in, we know exactly where we are for ignition timing. So the next phase is going to be putting the intake manifold gasket on and then the intake manifold itself. Um, so we'll just, uh, the next bit of this video will show how we do that, what sealants we use uh, and where they're applied to. Okay, so um, applying the rubber end seals. First of all, you want a small bead of RTV silicon. Our chosen colour here is black. Um, all the way along the inner edge of the rubber seal. Then we can apply this to the engine. They will always look too long, but they do always fit. Making sure that all the lips are over, the edges are correct. And then the next phase is to apply RTV silicon across the top of this, as you can see at the back edge here. Hopefully you've got enough light in there, Steve. Ooh, just about. Yep. So um, we pre-smear that as well. Um, and one key factor is getting the silicon just up the cylinder head, uh, approximately halfway between the lower edge of the cylinder head and the intake manifold bolt hole here. 
um, because there's a little edge there that does need silicon applied to it um, to just to fill a very small gap that's left by the intake manifold. With that bit done, the intake manifold gasket, and remember these are razor sharp, they will cut you, there's no might about it. Um, we'll apply blue Hylomar on the waterways and the intake um, ports here on both sides of the gasket before this then goes down and the end clamps get put on. So the next phase of this video will be this gasket on here and then we'll lower the intake manifold onto it. Okay, so with the uh, valley gasket in place, blue Hylomar is applied to both sides, the end clamps are down and tight. We then need to install the intake manifold. So we've already put the rear water outlet on because it's far easier to put it on now than later, but you can put it on later. So we need to position this in place and lower it down. So from here, I'm just lining up one side, then lowering down the other. And then we can get our bolts. Now, originally uh, you'll be using the bolts that you took out. We do also do stainless steel ones if uh, that tickles your fancy which it does all of our customers, or most of them. Um, we do put a little bit of uh, copper slip or white grease on the bolts, just as a preventative measure there. So what we'd normally do is get all the bolts started down one side, but loose, and then we'll move on to the second side. So with all of the intake manifold bolts down one side, as I said before, loose, put all of them in. Um, we can then start applying the bolts this side. Now this, um, the degree of how much levering the intake manifold down just to get this bolt started will vary depending on the deck height of the block, how much the heads have been skimmed, the thickness of the head gaskets you're using, etc. Um, so uh, we've never had an intake manifold that doesn't fit, doesn't line up, but sometimes you do have to apply a little bit of force downwards on here to get this bolt started. However, what you can then do is do this bolt up. And once this is nipped up, again, it will compress that gasket down and then allow us to start this bolt here. So I can start that with my fingers there and then get this bolt in. And then once this one's compressed down a little, we can then move to the next bolt along. So we'll go all the way along this doing that and then come back to you. Okay, so with all of the bolts now pulled down, uh, we now wanna go around and uh, nip them all up to 30 foot pound. However, we're going to go around these three, maybe even four times, because you'll know every next time you go around, you will get a little bit more on them. So. You're probably better cut, Steve, because it's going to take a while. It's the magic of TV. It'll yeah. be over in a flash. Right, so the intake manifold is all torqued down. We've been around four times. Um, we're happy that there's, um, everything's compressed down. Everything's torqued up to 30 foot pound. Uh, obviously, if you haven't installed the rear water outlet, now is probably a good time to do it. The two-wheel drive thermostat housing is the one we'd normally supply with this kit um, with the water bypass. However, we won't actually be using it on this vehicle because as mentioned in part one of this carburetor uh, installation series, there is sometimes a need for a hybrid, a crossover. So we're installing the four-wheel drive one. This is actually what came off the car originally because it was, uh, as previously mentioned already, a carburetor four-barrel setup. Um, still got the water bypass, which we'll discuss in a minute. But the customer's top hose is obviously already formed and correct for this water takeoff to come off here, as opposed to coming off and pointing straight forward. So uh, no need to spend money on a thermostat housing we don't need. We'll reuse original. In terms of plumbing, in fact, shall I pause here for a second? So well, you're going to now. Yeah. Right. So there we go. If I make a mistake like a minute ago, we don't have to start from that beginning again. In terms of plumbing the carburetor setup, the water flows from the cylinder heads up into the intake manifold at the front here. It's going to travel forward to the thermostat and to the rear of the intake manifold as well. Now, from the rear of the intake manifold, the water outlet would normally go to the heater matrix and then return back to the timing cover or water pump, which we'll cover in a second. Thermostat, 
is obviously held in place by thermostat housing. And then we have the bypass hose on here. Now there's three different configurations of timing cover. This is obviously the two wheel drive or SD1, P5, P6 style. Um, this has a return pipe on the rear of the timing cover. That will be utilized for the bypass hose from the thermostat housing. Now the idea of the bypass here, um, a lot of older vehicles, uh, MGB certainly, um, have a flow valve to the heater matrix off of this rear water outlet. Now if that was in the closed position, i.e. it's summertime, you don't want any heat through your heater matrix, the water has nowhere to go at the back. If you don't have this bypass, water has nowhere to go at the front either while the engine's warming up and the stat is closed. We've had a few vehicles in before with that setup, and what you find is you get temperature spikes because the engine will warm up, the stat will open, you'll get a shunt of cold water through the engine, and it, it spikes down again, and you'll get this fluctuation until equilibrium through the cooling system is reached. So much better to have this bypass in place because you're gonna circulate water through the engine rather than having this sort of dead end to the system while your heater matrix is closed off. Um, again, it's the way we've been doing it for a long time now. We never have any issues at all, whereas we've seen vehicles without the bypass on, they might have a, a partially blocked or a completely blocked heater matrix and that's causing problems because you've got no flow until the stat opens, etc. The heater matrix return on the two wheel drive cover will come into the um, top of the water pump here. Now, uh, we should be able to jump to the Defender now and look at the four-wheel drive timing cover options. Edelbrock Performer intake manifold here then on the Land Rover setup. One little tip um, on the intake manifold, there is this little stub sticking up here. You can install it with that in place, I think many of our customers do. Um, however, it does just squish the uh, rocker cover gasket here if you've uh, got the rubber rocker cover gaskets, as most of these engines do, uh, other than early MG ones, which MG rocker covers aren't generally fitted on a Land Rover, are they, Steve? Not normally. Not normally. Um, anyway, uh, so just removing that with a, a grinder, obviously pre-installation, making sure no swarf goes down the uh, intake port or anything, um, is uh, a little top tip there. Um, so from here, Installation of the carburetor is uh, going to be just the same. Uh, once we've got the waterways all plumbed up, we'll come back to this. Just thought it'd be nice to show you the auto kickdown linkage installed here, though, before we um, fill the picture with other items. So, uh, installs onto these rear two bolts of the intake manifold in this orientation. Um, this will then come off to the carburetor, as we'll see, and this comes down to the kickdown linkage. Steve, if you swing yourself around, I'll grab my torch. On the back of the cylinder head here is a bracket. Can you see that? And then I just need to become part of the Land Rover. Okay, you'd be at one with that. Um, this is that will actually hold the outer um, cable, and then the inner will come up to the the linkage here. Um, so yeah, that's the auto kickdown linkage installed. But if you're buying one of them from us, it, we have photos of them installed as well on the uh, the shop page for them. Right, let's get to plumbing. Plumbing on the four-wheel drive setup then. Um, we still have got the rear water outlet heading off to the heater matrix. Return from the heater matrix, passing underneath the intake manifold, going to the port on the back of the timing cover. This one was blanked off with a, a core plug, so that does need drilling and pulling out. Best to do that with it before the intake manifold is actually installed, obviously being careful of swarf uh, in the valley area. Thermostat bypass returns to the second port on the back of the timing cover, which was originally used for the uh, return from the heater matrix. Obviously bottom hose is still returning to the water intake, and top hose is going to the top of the radiator. Uh, on top of the radiator, it's probably worth just pointing out, uh, there's an air bleed that was originally coming off of the SU um, tower that sits between the carburetors. That's an air bleed that can be blanked off. And then the second port goes off to the header tank. Now, a different setup would be an intermediate serpentine cover. They don't have any ports on the back of the timing cover. So in that instance, the lower hose, um, we'd normally have a T-piece in or two T-pieces for the return from the heater matrix. 
and for the bypass, um, if you've only got one return on that bottom hose, you could tee both of those in together. Um, and if you don't have the air bleed or the, the takeoff on the top of the radiator for the header tank, um, alternatives that I've seen are header tank that goes down to the bottom hose as well. So that'd be bottom hose to um, header tank and the returns from the thermostat bypass and the heater matrix to the bottom hose as well. Um, that covers the coolant setup there. Um, Luke's actually working on this vehicle, so we'll get Luke to install the carburetor next um, and the servo takeoff for the brake vacuum. And at that point, we'll then be in a position to look at the kick down linkage adjustments and also where we go with the breather setup. Okay, so Steve's now uh, got that pipe work uh, installed. We've left the top hose off because we're going to fill from the top hose, which I'll explain in a second. Um, thermostat housing's on, obviously. Uh, One-way port for the brake servo is on. Uh, we did actually find with uh, this new union, we did just have to ream the intake manifold very slightly so it um, missed the hex, uh, just so it'd screw in fully. It wasn't too much of a job, uh, but worth noting. Never had a customer say that he's not been able to refit their original one though, unless everyone's just done exactly what we've done here without saying anything. Um, on the plumbing basis, we've covered what's connected to the intake manifold. What we haven't covered is the radiator connections. Obviously from the um, thermostat housing here, we go top hose to the top of the radiator. The water pump here on the two wheel drive goes straight down to the um, bottom of the radiator. Now other connections would be to the header tank. Depending on the radiator, that can be done in various different ways. We've got a header tank here. We have a port on the top and the bottom. The bottom port on this goes to the bottom of the radiator, meaning as we fill the system uh, through the top hose, the water will come up and slowly come up the level here, because we'll be holding the top hose quite high. The top port on the header tank is going to the top of the radiator, so that's acting as an air bleed, um, which is quite good when the engine's running. If any air is in the top of the radiator, it would find its way up into the air gap that we've got on the uh, header tank here, and it would take the um, water to fill that volume in the radiator off the bottom of this. Um, if you haven't got those ports on the radiator, then you can obviously introduce a T-piece into the bottom hose that would go to the bottom of the header tank. Um, uh, some header tanks don't have a top connection on them and uh, some cars don't have an air bleed on the top of the radiator. Um, they're not absolutely essential. You can obviously work on getting the air out yourself. It does just make bleeding the system a lot easier though. So maybe installing an air bleed into the top hose, essentially at the highest point, going to the top of the header tank would, would be a good idea. Um, another thing that we've installed is the uh, customer's original temperature sensor. Um, so uh, as you'll see on the Land Rover, we'll cover that, but Land Rovers uh, on a V-belt setup would bolt straight into this intake manifold. Um, the uh, kit car world, obviously you've got an aftermarket gauge, Smith's, VDO, many other names out there, including many that don't have names off eBay, etc. Um, but they all should be supplied with a matched sender. Gauges do not all have a generic sender. The resistance value of them at given temperatures is generally all different. So making sure your gauge has a matched sender, and if the thread of that does not fit into the intake manifold, getting an adapter. So um, I forget the thread rating on that, but we, you know, um, off the top of my head, but we have it written down and, and we can let you know it if you, if you need it. So, moving on to the carburetor then. Carburetor then, uh, nice and easy to install. There's one little tip worth noting, which I'll show you in a second. Um, as previously stated in part one, we will set the float bulb heights, we will fit the correct needles and jets for your engine capacity and tune. Uh, fuel banjo will be on, uh, however, check the angle is correct for you and check that the bolt is tight. And we'll have left the um, vacuum advance port here open that's correct for your distributor. Um, probably best uh, to check that's installed, or if not, um, it's in the uh, packet that comes with the carburetor, and just pop that in. Um, probably worth putting a little bit of sealant on the threads just to make sure there's no air leaks. Uh, we're actually going to reuse the customer's original uh, throttle cable um, on this, and the uh, bracket that he had as well on the original carb setup, the, the Holly setup, is the same style we use, so it, it will be no different for installation. 
So whilst installing this, because of the uh, shape of this, we have to put this on at the same time as the carburetor. We can't put it on later over the stud. But with the gasket in place and the stud screwed into the intake manifold, we can pop that down. And then we can drop a second bolt, or sorry, a first bolt, but a second fixing point in which would be a lot easier if I was the other side of the car. Yeah, well, someone stood in the way and holds the camera there. So. Yeah, there we go, that's that one started. So we're in place. Um, so now it's a case of putting them down, washer and nut on the stud there, and uh, nipping those up. Go going, oh, you are still recording. I am. I thought you'd hit the stop button. No. Going on from there, um, we're gonna go uh, inline fuel filter up to the fuel banjo. Um, and then uh, we've got a video to record on this on installing an ignition system. So we'll do that and then come back to this and uh, finish this video off, which is uh, obviously mounting of the breather system to the air filter and then road testing and setting up. Um, but at this point, we'll jump to the Land Rover and uh, look at the installation on that. Carburetor connections on the four wheel drive then. Um, very similar, just in different positions. So brake servo vacuum comes off of this intake runner here as opposed to the back, as we've uh, seen. Um, throttle cable, exactly the same installation. Choke cable will be as well. It's not yet on this vehicle. Uh, we need to get off the ramp so we can get the driver's door open properly to install the throttle, uh, choke cable. Um, we'll show you the other end of the throttle cable. Um, is it slightly different on four-wheel drive vehicles. However, for now, uh, kick down linkage. As you can see, we've got the cable attached here now and the threaded rod going up to the lower ball joint on the uh, linkage of the carburetor. So uh, that's where we'd normally install that to. One little tip is the hole that this um, return spring goes through. We actually drill a second hole just a little bit further up to make sure there's no binding with the spring uh, through operation of the throttle. So we can see here we've got nice smooth, smooth operation there. No problem whatsoever. And it's returning nicely. Um, right. EFI to carb pressure regulator then. Nice and simple setup. From your EFI fuel pump, you're gonna have your feed line. That comes into the side of the regulator. It doesn't matter which side. We're gonna end up with even pressure across the uh, regulator on both sides there. The return line that goes back to the tank comes out the base of the regulator. To set the pressure, we're gonna install our low pressure um, fuel gauge here onto the opposite side to the feed, obviously removing the pipe that runs up to the carburetor, um, but this will allow us to set pressure, um, about six PSI is where we normally set them to. With that then removed, we can come off of there and run up to the carburetor, onto the fuel banjo, obviously. Um, the vacuum reference on here, we don't use, we don't need to, we don't need to uh, reference it and adjust pressure according to inlet manifold vacuum, that's, that's not needed, so you can cap that off or leave it blank, whatever you like to do there. Uh, in terms of actually making the adjustment, it's just this dome cap off the top, undo the locking nut and then under there is an adjusting screw. Um, I'd imagine it's fairly straightforward, but to anybody that wants to know, that's how we set them and plumb them. Okay, so this is the other end of the throttle cable. Um, so initially the cable itself comes with a ball on the end of it, which we cut off. That then goes, gets inserted into the end of the throttle clamp and a grub screw locks that off. As you can see here, um, the clamp's been used just around one edge of the uh, fork. Um, all throttle pedals are slightly different. Um, so um, ideally this would actually have a, a male tab kind of adapter rather than a female slotted adapter. So uh, after seeing this one, we're actually now gonna have some made up like that as well. Um, but as you can see, it's still workable. Um, it's just, I know we can uh, do something that's actually, um, well, looks a lot nicer. Not that people often go around looking at cable pullers on throttle pedals. But anyway, that's how we that section have. works. I just have, yeah. Um, let's go back to the breather setup. Breather setup on the 4 before then, actually incredibly similar to the uh, Cobra. Uh, this style of rocker cover has got the, the standard original breather on the back here, whereas the Cobra had the little cone filter. Uh, original canister here, running round to a port on the back. It's been fitted here. 
Um, obviously, if we had two ports, one on each rocker cover that was uh, larger, then they'd get two pieced together and put to there. In terms of adjusting the auto kickdown linkage, if you're running an auto box, you're the wrong side now. No, I'm not. I am, but I'm not. Okay. We'll come back in a second. Right, so now you're the right side. Uh-huh. The uh, kickdown adjustment then, this threaded rod, uh, you can't just turn it because the uh, right hand thread on both ends. Um, so it's a case of removing one end to adjust this, but it's not an adjustment that you need to actually set the cable other than setting the additional, the initial length. We supply them too long, so you can cut them to size. Um, if you look at the cable here, the adjustment for the kickdown cable is all done on the adjuster here to this bracket but you need the bar length here to be correct to actually allow you to get some adjustment there. So um, moving this to about its midpoint, having the crimped collar just on the edge of the um, cable outer sheath there, and then adjusting your rod length so that the bell crank here um, on a closed throttle just has that collar just off there is a good starting point. Um, you will not achieve a great kick down with that. You will then need to adjust the um, outer sheath here out to um, be pulling on the cable a bit more here. Um, we generally look, a, a reasonable setting is sort of running at 55 mile an hour, um, assuming on standard wheels, standard diff ratios, etc. And on a three quarter to full pedal should achieve kick down. Um, if for some reason uh, you're getting a harsh gear change or it's holding onto the revs at light throttle, um, and, and not changing up a gear on a light throttle, then this is too tight, so you'll need to back it off a bit. Um, but that's how the, the kickdown bracket is installed and adjusted. So Steve's now got the carburetor installed and everything connected up. We'll just go through those connections. So um, starting at the rear, just to make it tricky for you, Steve. Um, the breather port, not sorry, not the breather port, the one-way vacuum port is uh, piped up to the brake servo. We've got the fuel supply uh, coming up, going through the filter here, up to the fuel banjo, which has been uh, nipped up at the correct angle to avoid the air cleaner we've dry fitted. The throttle cable uh, has been placed through the throttle bracket, connected with its uh, little uh, ball joint here. A uh, little bit of slack in the cable, generally a good idea, so there's no way it can just hold the throttle open and the return spring is on the uh, lower side of the lever coming back up to the bracket here. Uh, as mentioned in part one of these videos, when using an offy, uh, we do just adjust the bottom end of this bracket to avoid the um, intake manifold. On the other side of the carburetor, the choke cable has been installed. Um, so it's been cut to length, first of all, and then the solid uh, cable has been bent through 90 degrees and then bent through 90 again, forward facing, to go through the uh, hole in the uh, linkage arm here. And then obviously it's clamped off at the back. So in terms of actually installing a carburetor, we're done with exception of the air cleaner. So this is actually customer's original air cleaner from the Holly setup but um, the one we would supply would be uh, the same, if not incredibly similar. The port would look different to this though, but as mentioned in part one of the videos, port comes off the bottom. It then gets connected to the breather port. Now the breather port on this en particular engine is uh, different to what we would normally see. You'd normally see a canister on here with the breather port on most, and then the filler on this side. Um, and then uh, there would be an original little mushroom filter on here. You can't buy them anymore, so what a lot of people do is exactly what this is, which is a, um, uh, an aftermarket air filter setup, and then one breather. Some rocker covers have two um, sort of 16 mil breather ports on them. I think MG original ones do. Worth mentioning there, actually, the MG original ones actually come off in the center here. Um, which we blank off with a plug and then we um, actually pop them into the, the top of the rocker covers, T-piece them together off each side and then go into the one port on the base of the air cleaner. So with that on there, Steve will uh, do that jubilee up. I'll leave it there so it's obvious it's not done up. And then your air filter goes in, sits nicely in place, make sure it's tucked in. Same with the top. Large washer. And then this has got a bit of a different nut on top, but a wing nut or whatever. 
and there's the air filter installed. They are fitted a bit, Steve. You did, and there's even, proof of it too. You can take the fingerprints off of it, so there's no proof of it. Okay, so um, correction to this video already. A moment ago I said we drill the tops of the MG rocker covers for the breather pipes. We don't, we've got this engine in here, we can actually show you what we do. So for MG original rocker covers, uh, this is an example of two breather pipes teeing together, going to the base of the air cleaner. Uh, the original breather pipes come out of this port here on both sides. We remove the pipe, because it's reused in a moment, and cap that with, uh, interestingly, that's a core plug out of the end of a rocker shaft, fits perfectly. That pipe that's removed from there is then drilled and loctited into uh, the rocker cover on the outside here. Breathe the pipes in, go up and T-piece together. One other little note is there's an arm that comes off this uh, linkage here that nothing attaches to it, nothing pushes on it or anything, um, but it needs removing because on the op throttle operation it would foul the uh, rocker cover. So that's just removed. So that is the MG rocker cover uh, breather setup. That concludes uh, part 2A of this video then. Um, so if you're um, now looking at setting up and tuning the carburetor, watch part 2B.